we're going to look for in linear independence of functions. And if we're going to compare functions, we need them to all have a common domain. So it wouldn't really make sense if one function only took positive numbers, another one only took negative numbers. How could we really compare the two functions to see if they're independent? So we're going to have n functions, f1, f2, fn. And these functions have common domain. So when I say common domain, I mean the domain of function one equals the domain of function two, which is the same domain as all the functions. So these functions these functions are linear linearly independent. If you could probably fill this out if you took linear algebra. I'm going to use summation notation. So if the sum of CK FK of X from K equals one to N. So if this new function, which is the sum of the other functions, if this equals zero for all, x in the domain. So not just for a few x's, but if this is 0 for all the x's, uh, then we say uh, the system is, wait, this would be linear. Ah, we have to look at co uh, coefficients. So if this is 0 for all x in the domain, and not all ck equals zero. So obviously if you just do zero times each function, you'll definitely get the zero function overall. So <coughs> we're looking for a non-zero combination of in integer, or not integers, real numbers to add up to uh, be the zero function. So it's a little bit tricky. We're going to go through uh, two examples here. So determine linear independence. So first function will be x, second function x squared third function x cubed, and fourth function will be 2x. Think of a linear combination of f1 through f4, so that will look like c1 f1 plus c2 f2 plus c3 f3 plus c4 f4. Think of a combination that actually gives us the zero function. I'll give you a hint. F1 and F4 are how we're going to do it. So what's one possibility for C1 and C4? Two and one. So I think that'll almost work. We'll go... Two and negative one. Maybe. Yeah, so they got to have opposite signs, but basically two F1. What about C2 and C3? Since their powers are different, they must be zero. Yeah, they're basically unique functions that won't really have any parts that will cancel out with other functions. So I can't put any part of F2 and F3 in here. So I have to have 0 F2 plus 0 F3 plus negative 1 F4. And now I'm just going to plug in F1 was X. So we got 2X plus 0 plus 0 minus 1 times... 2x. And we have 2x minus 2x, we get down to 0. So in this case, these functions are dependent because I found a non zero combination that gives me 0. So I could write these functions are not linearly independent.
So basically we found a combination of constants, not all of which were zero, that gave us a zero function. So that's what it means to be dependent. So any questions on that example right there? Let's do another example. This one will be only two functions. Our f1 will be e to the px, and f2 will be e to the qx. Now, <clears throat> above I wrote down that the uh, domain had to be the same. Let's take a minute, let's go back to that last problem. What's the domain of every function in our previous example? So our domain is bigger than just positives. All real numbers. So these are polynomials, so they can take all real numbers. So they have the exact same domain right there. What about this example I just wrote down, these exponential functions? What type of x's can they input? All real numbers. These can go all real numbers too. I, we, we just saw yesterday it could actually go all complex numbers as well, but we'll keep it real for the moment. All right, term linear independence. So can I do C1 F1 plus C2 F2? Uh, so that's C1 e to the px plus c2 e to the qx. So is there a non-zero that will make this zero? Uh, let's assume p is not equal to q. If p equals q, you just do one of them is negative the other. Just like one negative one would work. Having one, is that on top of the f2 e, is that a 7 or a 1 or a t right before the x e to the y? That? Yeah. That's a Q. Oh, that's a Q. Yeah. Q, P and Q, yeah. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Now, this is a little bit tricky to see right here. If P is not Q, one of them has to be bigger than the other. So I'll just assume P is greater than Q. If it's the other way around, you can just swap what I do right here. But I'll just assume one has to be bigger than the other. And I haven't done anything else with them, so I'll just assume p is bigger than q. So that means p minus q is greater than 0. So let's rewrite the uh, p power. Yeah, I have to rewrite my constant in a way we're not, we, we usually write it the other way, so C, let's just, I'll use A. Let's let, uh, what's the best way to write this? So I want E to A1 equals, I'm going to swap out my constant for E to the A1 so that I can push my constant basically into the power. Uh, so this would be A1 is ln of C1. So I'm going to just change my constant around. So I can swap out C1 for uh, E to the A1, which I think is basically what you were saying. But I'm just trying to keep the bookkeeping correct. Um, and then we'll do the same thing for C2. So we got E to the A2 will be C2, which is the same as saying a2 is ln of c2. So we got e to the px plus a1 plus e to the qx plus a2. I want to say that a1 and a2 Ooh, this is going to be a little tricky. I actually made a huge assumption that I didn't mention. 
by doing this substitution, what am I assuming about my constant C1? They're not zero. It's not zero, and even more than that. They're not negative. Yep. So I'm assuming my C1 is positive. So basically I threw out all possibilities of negatives. So this probably isn't the best substitution to make. So if I did this, I'd also have to check. Yeah, so this is probably not a very good move right here. I can already tell e to the px and e to the qx are always positive. So I can tell immediately at least one of these two has to be negative, these constants, if we have a chance. So I pretty much just threw out that possibility right there when I, if I make this substitution. So I don't think we want to go through this route. These are going to be independent, and I think we just play around with the powers a little bit. B minus Q plus Q. So we'll write this as E to the P minus Q plus P X. So this may seem completely random right now, but hopefully this will make sense in a Hopefully this will make sense in a minute. All right, so all I did was I subtracted, oh, that's not, that should be a plus Q, wow. All right, so I'm just subtracting Q and adding it back in right now. So I'm not changing anything. So we got E to the P minus Q X, E to the Q X. All right, what can I factor out? E to the QX. That was my motivation for doing it. Probably wasn't obvious when I was doing that, but I wanted to factor out at least one of these two E to the um, PX or QX. Now, can e to the qx ever equal zero? Nope, so I can divide by it and not have to worry about that. So that can disappear. Now from here, So I think from here we can say that this function right here is not constant. This e to the p minus qx is not constant. It's going to be an exponential function. And there are no, there's no constant c1 and constant c2 that would turn this function into the zero function. Just thinking about graphing, c1 would be a vertical stretch and c2 would be a vertical shift. So the basic exponential function looks like this. No matter how much I stretch it and shift it vertically, it's never going to look like this. Well, there is one C1 value that would make it look like this flat line. What C1 value would make it look flat? Zero. Zero, which is exactly, that would be linear dependence if they're all zero. So if C1 and C2 are zero, we get the horizontal line that's always zero. But we knew that beforehand. So there's no uh, I'm sort of looking at the graph. There's no way to turn this graph into a horizontal line without having C1 and C2 both zero. All right, so this is linear. Uh, these functions are linearly independent. Now ready for a heavy duty theorem, which I don't think I'm gonna prove. So this theorem is 19.2. So since it's just a theorem, does it mean that it could change, that it's not proven, because it's not a law? You're asking that because you've heard theory in science? Yeah. So theory has nothing to do with theorem whatsoever. Uh -oh. They're only off by one or two letters, but they're completely different things. So in math, a theorem is something that 
uh, it has a hypothesis, and when that's satisfied, then the conclusion is always true. Oh, so this is like the law equivalent of the science? No. So, <laughs> science, they run lots of experiments and say, oh, we got this result almost every time we ran the experiment. Therefore, we have overwhelming evidence that this thing is happening. Like, if I drop my pen, it'll go downwards because of gravity. Nobody's surprised by that. It's a law of gravity. Uh, but laws are just things that have been seen, observed lots and lots and lots of times. Whereas in the math world, we actually prove with logic that if my, if not real things, but theoretically, if my pen was off the ground, it would have to hit the ground. Uh, but they're more abstract. Math is just more abstract. So it's, if you satisfy a hypothesis, you always get the conclusion. There's no like, oh, what if there's biological contamination? There is no biological contamination in this. There is no friction. There is no any of these things that screw up some of the other experiments you may see. Like maybe there's a huge breeze going upward, so I drop my pen and it doesn't actually fall. Like I'm in a wind tunnel or something like that. I drop my pen and it goes up. I'm like, oh, gravity doesn't exist. <laughs> no, but there's a huge breeze that blew it upwards, even though I thought it should have fallen downwards. Gotcha. So there's other things that come into play, uh, or maybe there's a black hole nearby, so it's not going to fall down. Something like that. <laughs> so it like, depends. Well, yeah, maybe we're on Earth, so things fall towards the Earth, but then if we're close to a black hole or if the sun, for some reason, gets very close to us, other things are going to start happening. At that point, things like global warming don't matter. If we're going to enter the sun in a couple <laughs> minutes, it's going to get very hot. <laughs> uh, but theorem 19.2 is still going to be true. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> so you can still be using, you can apply theorem 19.2, and even after we're all incinerated, this will still be true. <laughs> all the books it's written in will be gone, but <laughs> the idea will still be valid. Never will use it then. Not at least. I don't know. What other aliens know calculus? <laughs> we're about to be on Mars, so even if Earth is incinerated. You need to go back to middle school. All right, theorem 19.2. It's nothing to do with Mars. All right, so if our functions f1, f2, fn, and q of x are continuous. Now this gets a little more precise. They have to be continuous on an interval, so uh, they may have different domains, but there needs to be one common interval that we're going to be uh, considering that these functions are continuous on. So maybe some functions uh, work for all positive integers, maybe some only go from 1 to 10, then we'll just shrink it down to 1 to 10 instead of, um, which basically is the intersection of all their uh, domains. Uh, so this linear ODE, Now remember, linear ODE means that your derivatives of y are not raised to higher powers. So when I put the word linear in front of ODE, I'll, I'll write that in parentheses. Uh, I'll write it as just yn. All the yn's are not raised to powers. So for example, what you won't see is like y double prime cubed, like this. Or you won't see something like a tangent of y triple prime. You won't see things like this. So your derivatives of y won't be inside functions. So that would make it not a linear ODE. So we can write this out. It's going to look like a fnx y nth derivative plus f n minus 1 of x y the n minus 1 derivative plus dot 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 plus f 
We went down to we do f1 of x, y prime. Now, if I want to label this consistently, I'll drop down to f0 of x. And this is the zero derivative of y, so we're not going to write, you could write a zero in the exponent, but I'm just going to write f0 of x, y. And now my numbering got messed up above, so I'll just drop in an f0 up with all the other f's at the top. All right, the theorem says this has exactly one solution. It'll be a function of x satisfying the initial conditions And these initial conditions we'll write as, they could come in slightly different forms. We'll have y of x naught equals y naught. Uh, y derivative of x naught will equal y1. And we have an nth degree, so I need n initial conditions. So the nth derivative at x naught will be some other number yn. Ooh, I just wrote down n plus 1 initial conditions because I started at 0. So we should stop at n minus 1. There we go. Now we got n initial conditions. So this is called the particular solution. So before you apply initial conditions, you're going to have uh, n constants in here. And when you eliminate those constants, you get what we call the particular solution, particular to the conditions that are right above. Now, if you change those conditions, you'll get a different particular solution. Think of it as basically where you drop your leaf in the water. Depending on where you drop it, you're going to get different curves. Uh, that was when we had a one-dimensional family of solutions. You can't really visualize an n-dimensional family of solutions. You can try two dimensions. That's about as high as you can really go, where you kind of pick, uh, I don't know. Well, let's not worry about trying to visualize higher dimensional stuff, but just think in the two dimensional case, it's wherever the leaf hits the water, basically, that x, y coordinate. Um, and that would be exactly that initial condition I, satisfied. I just circled right there. So that would be your initial x, your initial y coordinate, right there. That would be that condition. And that, that's valid for degree one ODEs, not degree two. Degree two, you need two initial conditions. So maybe a position and some type of initial direction, something like that. When so you call this particular solution, once I vaguely remember using that in our previous section, is that referring to the same thing? Yeah, so the before you plug in the conditions, you have what's called the general solution or the family of solutions. That's the when you have the plus C. Yeah, that's you. When the constants are in, that's called the general solution or the family. And then when you solve for the constants, you get the particular. Exactly. When you turn those constants to actual numbers, that's called the particular solution. So general solution is the ODE solution before. applying the initial conditions. So now we're going to have a brand new definition for homogeneous.
So before I write down the new definition, let's talk about the old definition. What was the old definition of homogeneous? Yeah, it was kind of like the same power. You can make this weird substitution and it basically eliminates the variable. That was the, you set u to y over x or x over y and then kind of follow through. And if you can turn into a function of, actually it's turned into a product of I think u to a power times x to a power, something like that. But that was the old definition. And then a homogeneous ODE was an ODE that had both of your coefficient functions were homogeneous. So this definition is different. So that was our old definition of homogeneous. I'll try to refer to that as homogeneous coefficient ODEs as opposed to just homogeneous ODE. So this homogeneous definition, this is when Q of X is the zero function in a linear ODE. And again, a linear ODE is at the top of the board there. So it's just functions of x times derivatives of y and equals zero. So that's what makes it homogeneous. So now we have another big theorem, 19.3. We're going to have our same n functions, u of x, are continuous on domain. They all have the same domain. We'll just call it d. So there's a few parts of this theorem. The first part, the homogeneous ODE. is F naught, now let's write it in decreasing order, so this is the homogeneous ODE, the, it has to be linear and equal to zero, so this has a family of n linearly independent solutions. And we let them as y1 of x y2 of x and 2yn of x. So there will be n solutions. Now this next one tells us how to put them together. So linear combo or combination I'll call it yc of x for combination. You get to add up ck yk of x for k equals 1 to n. So we can add a linear combination of these together and this linear combination is also a solution. And it's called the general solution. All right, last part. I think I just used the wrong word. Oh, goodness. General solution. According to my notes, I'm about to use the general solution to be the 
particular plus the combination. So one of these words should not be general. Alright, I'll just keep writing and then I'll look at your book at the end. Maybe they just call it family, the other one, not general. So the general solution of homogeneous ODE. Take that word homogeneous out. So to a linear ODE. Is the solution to the homogeneous version. Now what's the difference between the linear ODE and the homogeneous version. Homogeneous, you're taking your Q of X function and replacing it by zero. So you're basically solving a homogeneous version and then you're gonna solve the general version. So it's a solution of the homogeneous version plus the particular. the solution to the non-homogeneous. And it's going to look like y of x equals, so p is the, let's see, yeah, so yc is the linear combination. homogeneous solution and the YP is the non-homogeneous solution. So I think I messed up some of the names here. Alright, particular solution, we're going to call this YP. This is the YP of X, the particular solution. And this would be the, the general solution that N the family of the N parameter family of solutions. should be able to let us get around this. So then the general solution is the solution of the homogeneous plus the solution of the non-homogeneous. So we got the particular, non-homogeneous, and then the homogeneous. minutes. Let's let's look a little bit. I'm not going to prove the whole theorem, but <coughs> let's take a derivative of this linear combination. That'll give us some insight as to why this theorem is true. So I'll call this a sort of proof. So I'm taking a derivative of this y c of x. All right, first of all, what derivative rule would I use first here? Oh, 
won't actually even need a product rule, but before I have this product, what do I have to do first? Yep, so it's the sum rule. So we're gonna basically, it's gonna look like we're gonna commute the sum and the derivative, but we know that swapping the order is the sum rule, S-U-M. So what rule do I use here? I don't have to go to the full product rule because CK is a constant. Constant a multiple rule. And from here, I'll just write it as CK YK prime of X. So that's how I'll denote the derivative here. And this is YC prime of X. All right, now that you see the first derivative, what would I get with the second derivative? Would it be the same thing? Yep, double prime. So because of the linear combination, basically the derivative is a linear operator, which means it respects the linear, like multiplying by constants and adding. So we're gonna get summation CK Y double prime KX. And I think you can see etc. YN X is summation CK Y N K X. So basically your linear combination works really well with the derivative. If this was a quadratic combination, it would not work really well. I have crazy power rules, chain rule, things like this. But linear combinations are great with derivatives. So we're going to suppose. So here's the main difference between proof between theorems and uh, between theorems and math. What do they call them? Theories. Yeah. Theories and theorems. We make a supposition. We assume something is true, and you can never be sure something is true in the real world. There's a thing called certainty. It's not 100%. Reasonably certain this pen's gonna hit the table, but like I said, there could be crazy, there could be a, some weird magnet inside, something like that. So it may not hit the table every time, even though the table's below the pen. It's because you can't you can't suppose away every possible combination in the real world. Like, I can't guarantee there's no huge breeze that's just going to blow it out, you know, over here. So there's other intervening factors, or maybe there's some crazy friction or something like that. Whereas in the math world, what I write down is my supposition. There's nothing else going into it. All right, so we're going to suppose this uh, y... We're going to suppose just one of these yk's is solution to the linear ODE This would be the homogeneous linear ODE. All right, so I'll just write a summation to cut down on the amount of writing we're going to be doing. So it's going to be summation FK YK. zero. All right, so this combination equals zero. Uh, so I'm supposing yk is a solution to this right here. Oh, I shouldn't use the same variable to index as I'm using up here. So I'll suppose yi is a solution.
and yj. So we'll suppose we have two solutions. I want to show that let's use a ayi plus byj is also a solution. Well, let's go with constant multiple first, and then I'll go with sum instead of trying to do everything at one time. All right, so what I'm going to do is replace all these y's right here with yi. Uh, now I'm assuming yi is a solution, which I should have put y. So if yi is a solution, this means yi satisfies this property here. So what I'm going to do is replace yi with a times yi. And I'm doing it in the summation. So here's yi right there. So I'm just going to swap out fn. And now I have ayi cave derivative. I have to be a little bit careful about my derivative because I'm replacing. I actually circled way too much. I'll be super careful about what I'm circling. That's what I'm replacing. So I'm replacing it before I take the derivative. All right, I don't know if this equals zero. It better equal zero, that's what theorem tells me. So how can I, it's a slightly weird way to write the derivative, but we know the constant multiple rule. So we're taking the kth derivative of a constant times a function. So I can already bring the constant outside the derivative. So we got fn times a times yi kth derivative. So that was constant multiple rule right there. I think I'm done doing calculus right now. What can I do with the a in the summation? Bring it out front. So this is factoring. I can't bring fn outside, which should be an fk. Nobody said anything. Can't bring fk out because fk is going to change every time k changes. But I can certainly bring a outside, so this is going to be a factoring move. So if we consider what's in the parentheses, ignore that times a, what is that equal to in parentheses? I did a strategic zoom out so you would see the answer. It's zero. So we supposed that it was a solution. All I had to do was basically get the a away from that function. And I just used some calculus to and some algebra to move it outside. So what we got is a times zero. And what is a times zero? Zero. So there we go. A constant multiple of a solution to a linear ODE, a homogeneous linear ODE, is a solution to that linear homogeneous ODE. A lot of words you have to throw in to make the statement true. It's only true because our, our ODE was homogeneous and linear. Those were important factors. If I had squared any of these derivatives of y, this wouldn't have worked out. All right, so we just proved that constant multiples uh, are still a solution. Now we'll prove that sums are still a solution. And we have three minutes, maybe four minutes. We'll try to hurry. All right, I'll just move to the right a little bit. I think that'll be the best way to go. So I'm going to suppose yi and yj our solutions. That means summation. Okay, I'm not going to write the uh, k equals zero to n on my summations anymore. It's going to take too much time. So this is zero and f k y j k also equals zero. So that's what I'm supposing. They're both solutions. So when you plug them both in, you get zero out. And now I want to show that the sum uh, yi plus yj is a solution. So 
So I have summation fk of yi plus yj k derivative. We're doing the exact same thing as before. I'm just replacing y by yi plus yj right here. All right, what calculus move can I do with the k derivative here? Why am I allowed to distribute it like this? It's just the sum rule for derivatives applied k times in a row. So maybe it's a third derivative, but the third derivative of a function plus another function is the third derivative of the two functions. This is not an exponent. This would not be true for exponents at all. It would be very false. But with derivatives, there's the sum rule. You can just distribute basically the derivative to the sum, each sum individually. And you just do it over and over again because it's a kth derivative. All right, from here, I'm going to now distribute uh, fk. This is a product, so I get to distribute. We got fk yi kth derivative plus fk yj kth derivative summation. And I'm just going to reorder my sum. So right now it goes uh, f0 yi0 derivative plus f0 yj0 derivative. So what I'm going to do is pull all the yi's out front, and then the yj's will go next. So I'm just reordering with two separate sums. Why are both of these zero? Yep, that's what we assumed. So we assumed that they were both solutions, and what we proved is the sum of the two is also a solution. Technically, this is really a enough to prove it. You have to prove it works for constant multiples and for sums. And if I multiplied them by constants, I would be able to prove the exact same thing. I could have put two constants in, uh, like a y i and b y j. It would have worked out exactly the same right there. I would have just had an a and a b at the very end. So it would have been the same exact proof. Um, in order for all this to really work out, we had to have uh, these ODEs linear, or else um, all this easy derivative stuff would not have worked. So that covers 19, and then we'll get into uh, 20, where we will learn a new solution method called undetermined coefficients. So that was a lot of proofs. You really only need uh, the theorems and definitions I read at the beginning. So you know, I don't want to ask you to prove these during a midterm.